पृथिवी शांतिरंतरिक्षगम शांतिर द्यौ शांतिर तिष शांतिरवांतर दिशा शांतिरग्निशातिर वायु शांतिरादिशाति चंद्रमा शातिर नक्षत्राणी शातिराप शातिरोषदय शातिर्नस्पत शातिर गौशातिरजाशातिरशाशातिशातिर्ब्रह्मशातिर्ब्राह्मणशाति शातिरव शाति शातिर्मे अस्तु शाति मे दे बी पीस ऑन अर्थ एंड इन द स्काय मे दे बी पीस इन द वॉटर एंड इन ऑल डिरेक्शन्स मे दे बी पीस इन द प्लांट्स इन द ट्रीज एंड इन एनिमल्स मे दे बी पीस इन द हार्ट्स ऑफ ऑल बीइंग्स मे दे बी पीस इन एवरी वन एंड इन एवरी थिंग सर्वेत्र सुखिन सन्तु सर्वे सन्तु निरामया सर्वे भद्राणि पश्यन्तु मा कशि दुख भाग भवस्तर तो दुर्गा सर्व भद्रा पश्यतु सर्वसद्बुद्धिमात सर्वत्र नंदतो may all be happy and healthy may all see what is good and may no one experience misery may all overcome their obstacles and acquire good tendencies may people everywhere find joy and fulfillment let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts a good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point that point can be our own breathing let us therefore practice breathing with awareness as we breathe in let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love strength and compassion and as we breathe out let us release all the stress anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind let us practice this way for a while let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart although god is present everywhere and in every one the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our own hearts we can meditate in any way we have been taught to remain focused we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of god in our hearts
सतो मा सत्कमया तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमया मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमय आविरावीर्मेथी रुद्रयत्ते दक्षिण मुखम तेन मां पाहि नित्यम मे द डिवाइन लीडर्स फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल फ्रॉम डार्कनेस टू लाइट फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोटैलिटी मे द डिवाइन कॉन्शियसनेस फिल अवर हार्ट्स एंड प्रोटेक्टर्स So today we will take the set of verses which answer the question the student had asked the teacher about how does the bondage arise as we have seen the central teaching of this text is that our true nature is infinite pure and free that's who we are every one of us is infinite every one of us is perfect every one of us is completely free every one of us is also birthless and deathless now that's not our present experience at all our in fact the present experience is just the opposite we know we were born at some point we will die sometime no matter how great we might be in some respects deep down we know that by no means are we perfect by no means are we eternal and while we enjoy certain kinds of freedoms we don't feel completely free and the, so the our present experience and what the books tell us who we are there is a big gap and so our present experience is said to be the state of bondage now in the language of myth this sense of being somehow separated from who we originally are occurs in different traditions and almost all traditions and gets expressed in many different ways somehow at some unspecified time in the past everything was ideal everything was perfect in the in indian mythology sometimes they speak about the golden age the satya yuga when everything was perfect and then the books say that today we are living in this kali yuga which is somehow a big fall a big degeneration from how things were in the past in the language of in the, in the biblical language there is clearly the the story of adam and eve and how the garden of eden how everything was perfect but the act of disobedience to what god had told them then they came down in into this state of mortal beings and this fall from the garden of eden they were expelled from that ideal state and the goal therefore is somehow recovering and going back to that ideal state so what is mentioned here is that at present when we somehow seem to have been separated from our own true nature how to go back to being who we are it's somewhat paradoxical that being who we are is more difficult than being someone else so from being this free and immortal being divine being we have effortlessly it seems become this mortal human being 
I don't think there was much effort involved. We found we are already human beings. But now, to go back to our true nature needs enormous effort. And that's why I said it's paradoxical that somehow being our true selves is more difficult than being someone else. In a relative sense, <clears throat> we might find that is true even in our day-to-day -day life. There is often uh, a gap between our external persona and internal being. For one thing, when people around us see us, they don't see us fully. They don't know who we are. All that they know is what they see. And what they see is the external part of my personality. Most people have no idea what's going on in the head of somebody else. People can guess, people can speculate, but only each one of us knows what thoughts, what ideas, what emotions are going on within us. So when we look at other people, we are not getting a complete picture. And when they look at us, they are not getting a complete picture either. But deep down inside, we know who we are. And so sometimes we have to ask ourselves, how much time and energy I am expending to make this external part of me better, more acceptable, because that's what people see, and how much time and energy I'm spending to take care of this inside, which only I can see. And sometimes this might get reflected in the way we mention at, at home maybe, is those parts of our home where generally we welcome visitors, where visitors can come. By and large, most people try to keep the living room in a presentable state, because that's what people see, that's what people come. But maybe your inner rooms, or maybe your garage or your, or your basement, that's not where we welcome generally outsiders or visitors. And so oftentimes we may pay more attention to the condition of the living room and not so much to the other rooms where only we have access. It's a, this is a little bit like that, paying more attention to our the side of us that is visible to the world and either postponing or not paying enough attention to insight. So that gap, bridging that gap is very important. And there is another, a higher gap, which I spoke about before, that our human identity and our divine identity. So just like there is a gap between my external persona and my internal being, there is a gap between my true spiritual identity and my present human identity. And the goal is to bridge this gap. And unless and until I'm able to bridge this gap, I'm in a state of bondage. And why does this bondage occur? This is what this set of verses will try to show. So let's look at them. Verse number 139. Akhanda nitya dvaya bodha shaktya spuranta matmana mananta vaibhavam sama brunotya vriti shakti resha tamo mai rahu rivarka bimbam. The infinite glory of the Atman which shines with the power of the un indivisible, eternal, and non-dual consciousness is covered by the concealing power of ignorance, the way the sun is covered by Rahu. 
the infinite glory of the Atman, look at these three adjectives that are used there, indivisible, eternal, and non-dual. Because the Atman, because the true self is indivisible, what, what does indivisible mean? Why is it so much emphasized in the text? Because when things get divided, or when things get chopped off, then it, for instance, there is this one entity, this like say, this one object, and if I divide it, then it becomes into two parts. Now, because this is not like one solid whole, clearly, all material objects are made up of material particles. There are atoms and molecules and so it's easy to divide them because it's already there are parts which are existing and those parts are somehow now held together by some force. But if a thing doesn't have part at all, then it cannot be divided. Because dividing anything really means that which is one is made into two, three, four, or any number of parts, any number of divisions. Now, when thing is broken, that is the end of that thing. I mean, look at the human body. So what do we say is death? Ultimately, as the scriptures sometimes say, dust returning to dust, or the material particles that have constituted this body returning back to the elements. And that's what happened after cremation or burial. Now, if something cannot be divided at all, then it cannot end. There is no death for that thing. So whenever you find the adjective indivisible, in Sanskrit it's called akhanda. Khanda means a part. Akhanda means no parts, cannot be divided, which is another way of saying it is immortal, which doesn't end. And because it is indivisible, Therefore, it is eternal. Eternal means no beginning, no ending. And because it is eternal, it is non-dual. Because if it's eternal, and it's the only thing that exists, then there is no other thing. That's why it's non-dual, and therefore it is infinite. So all of these three adjectives, which are all interconnected, one is there because of the other. So what this verse points out is that this infinite glory, the Atman is the only shining existence, only shining reality. And somehow that is covered by a power of ignorance and that is called the concealing power. In Sanskrit, it's called avarana shakti. Concealing means avarana, covering. And power is shakti. So avarana shakti, so one of the powers of ignorance is that it covers the reality. And that's why oftentimes in language, ignorance is often associated with darkness and knowledge with light. Because what does darkness do? It covers. If you switch off all the lights in this room, I won't be able to see anything. Objects will still be here, but I won't be able to see them because the objects will be covered by that darkness. And when there is light again, then that, the covering goes away. So ignorance has the power to cover the way darkness has the power to cover. That's how when we speak about a rope that is mistaken for a snake in a semi-lit room, now that phrase semi-lit room or semi-darkness is important. Because it is a partially lit room, the rope gets partially covered. And what does it mean, partially covered? It just it doesn't mean a half of the rope is covered and half isn't. But what it means is the general characteristic of the rope are not covered. So what is the general characteristic of any object is this object. 
So for instance, I can refer to everything around me as this object, this object, this object. So I can pretty much refer to anything in this creation as this. That's the general name, common name. If I do not know what this object is called, if I don't know its specific name, I can say this object. But every object also has a specific identity, which has the specific name. That's how we distinguish a chair from a table. So when a, in a semi-darkness or in a semi-lit room, the rope is partially covered, meaning ropes, the rope's special identity, that it is a rope, that is covered. But because it is partially covered, what is not covered is that this object. And that's why we're able to see part of the rope that it is some object lying on the ground. I don't know what that object is, which is how I then mistake it for a snake. So that covering is called the concealing power of ignorance. And the example given here is the way the sun is covered by Rahu. This concealing power is referred to as powered by tamas, tamo mayin. We know about, we have studied the three gunas that every material object has. So when the, there is a predominance of tamas, that is the power of ignorance, that it is that tamas which has the power to cover. And the example of course is that of an eclipse just as the sun, the brightest object known to us in our own, um, is it galaxy, we call it? Oh, in our own galaxy, I don't know the terminology, I'm not an expert in astronomy. <coughs> but to those of us on this planet, the brightest object we know, which is closest to us, is the sun. But even the sun gets covered during eclipse. And is covered by Rahu, there is a, in Indian mythology, the sun is said to be, and there's a big story behind it, the sun is periodically swallowed by a demon called Rahu. And today we know there is no demon there. We know how this covering occurs. Even in an eclipse, even in total eclipse, the sun never gets completely covered. Even there is a partial covering. So that's the example given here. Just as the bright sun can get covered during eclipse, this brightly shining existence, which is pure consciousness, gets covered by the concealing power of ignorance. Next verse, 140. swatmani amalatara tejo vatipuman Anatmanam mohat ahamiti shariram kalayati tataf kama krodha prabritibhir amum bandhana gunaihi param vikshe pakya rajasa uru shaktihi yathayati. The deluded person sees the body, which is not the self, as I, when the true self, which is pure consciousness, is covered. The fierce power of rajas, known as the projecting power, then inflicts great suffering through bondage-producing qualities such as lust and anger. So here is the second power of ignorance. The first power was to hide, to cover. The second power called vikshepa shakti, it's called the power of projection, projecting. And in the example of the rope and snake, the identity of the rope is covered, and in place of the rope, a snake is projected. In the same way, because of ignorance, my true identity as a divine being is covered by the concealing power, and in its place, this human identity, identity of a a mortal 
vulnerable creature gets projected. And because of this, our present experience of being mortal vulnerable beings, we know there is no end to our trouble. All the stress, anxiety, worry, fear, at various levels that we have, it's all because of our present understanding of ourselves as these mortal human beings, subject to these enormous external forces of nature. And that's why it says it inflicts great suffering through qualities such as lust and anger. You might remember in the second chapter of the Gita, there is a set of two verses, verse number 62 and 63, I think. It just go, dhyayato vishayan pumsaha. It's a beautiful verse. It shows the chain reaction of how it begins with a person thinking about some object. And the more we think about something, the more attached we get to it. The more attached we get to it, then there is a desire to, to acquire it. When there are obstacles in the path to the desire, it leads to anger. And if that obstacle is greater than that I can handle, then it leads to grief. In all of this struggle, I forget the main purpose of life. And we can look at our own lives sometimes, it can happen that way. Sometimes the enormous pressures of daily living can be so high for some people that it seems a luxury to even ask about what is the purpose of life, what is the goal of life. It just seems like, who has time for all these things? We are worried about these bread and butter issues. Now, not everyone is worried to the same extent. There are some parts of the world where it might be very difficult. Think about people in Ukraine now. Um, it may be very difficult, especially in those parts of Ukraine where this war is raging, for them to have the luxury to sit and study a book like this. Because there are other more immediate concerns before them. But even if we are not in a war zone, war doesn't necessarily occur only outside. There's a lot of battles going on inside our hearts. And sometimes these inner battles can be more unbearable than the external battles. And so if in our own lives, if we have the leisure to think about these issues, some of the basic fundamental questions related to existence, then we should be grateful. Whether or not we find answers to these questions immediately, at least we have the privilege of asking these questions. And that's why he says, inflicts great suffering through bondage producing qualities such as lust and anger. In other words, the more of these tendencies are there in my heart about attachment, anger, desire, grief, the more stress and anxiety and worries I'll be riddled with, and more of those are there, then of course, there is no way I'm going to be able to ask questions like these, and there is no way I'm going to find answers to them. So we need, not that we can miraculously solve all problems and then turn to spiritual life. That probably will never happen. In the text, sometimes they give the example of saying, like a person going to the ocean front and saying, oh, I would like to go and take a dip into the ocean, but there are lots of these waves. Let the waves stop and then I will go. And that's never going to happen. So if we are thinking in our life, oh, I'm going to first sort out all my problems and then I'm going to find somehow this 
very calm, peaceful stretch in my life, and then I will concentrate on a study like this. It's never going to happen. What we can do, while we have limited control over things that are happening in the world outside, what we do have complete control over is how I can respond to whatever is happening around me. If someone is acting crazily around me, I may have no control over stopping that person's craziness, but I have complete control over my response to that craziness. Should I get annoyed? Should I get mad? Should I do this? Or I can be indifferent to it? Or I can, whatever. So how I react to whatever is happening around me, I have a freedom there. And that is the kind of freedom we need to exercise. And that's why this is among the basic preparations for Vedanta study. That unless I'm able to discover a measure of silence, a quiet within my heart, I won't be able to study and reflect and understand what's being taught here. And so we need to find a way to lift ourselves above things that pertain only to the perishable, evanescent concerns of the world. Not that we need to neglect it, no. Because we are living in the world, we need to take care of things. That's understood. But can we have... I mean, it's like this. When we try to find time for prayer and meditation every day, in spite of our busy schedules, we do, have, we do make our best effort to find some quiet spot to somehow do the kind of prayer and study and meditation that we feel we must do. So just as we are able to find something like that, even though not always perfectly, we must be able to find that quiet spot in our heart in order for success in our study, in our prayer, in our meditation. And if we are not able to do it, then it inflicts this great suffering through bondage. So one way of finding a way out of this bondage is first of all, freeing ourselves from this, what is called here as the bondage producing qualities. The more I'm able to minimize these bondage producing qualities, the more the possibility of freedom becomes closer and I can be more hopeful about it. There is also a verse in the Gita in the 16th chapter, I think verse 21, which, which says, Trividham naraka siedam dwaram nashanam atmanaha. There is this threefold door to hell. This is what the Gita says. Kama krodhas tatha lobhaha tasmad etat trayam tyached. This desire for perishable things, krodha, anger, and lovaha, greed. Anger, greed, and this lusting after this material, perishable things. These are what the Gita says is a threefold entry into hell. Yeah, it's not often that the Vedanta text use the words heaven and hell, but when they do, they do it in a very strong way. Verse 41. You'll see the next three verses are very poetic uh, and how powerfully all of these, the way, the basic thing is not, it's not complicated at all. That the reality is covered by ignorance. The ignorance has two powers. It covers the reality and it projects a falsehood in its place. That's the basic thing. The way it gets des described here in these verses is to generate 
in our heart that intense desire to overcome the bondage. And that's why you will see how, how it gets expressed here. 141. Mahamoha grasa grasana galitatma ga galitatma avagamano dhiyo nana vastham swayam abhinayan stad gunataya apare samsare vishaya vishapure chalanidhau nimajjon majjayam brahmati kumatif kutsitagatihi. Very poetic. Set in a wrong direction. With an unfit mind, a person whose self-knowledge has been swallowed by the crocodile of great delusion superimposes on the self the various states of the mind and identifying with them drifts up and down in this boundless ocean of samsara which is filled with poisonous material objects. Poisonous, the material objects are poisonous because just as poison can suck out all the vitality from within us, just running after this perishable temporary things of this world can drain us of all of our time and energy. And that's why they are like poison. And drifting up and down, up and down can also be understood as this repeated birth and death. We sp speak about, oh, descending on this planet, being born here and then dying and going someplace else. So this kind of a constantly traveling in this ocean of existence is compared to this drifting of up and down in this boundless ocean, being swallowed by the crocodile of great delusion. The crocodile comes very often in this book, as you will see. So this is pretty clear. But the, the way it gets expressed is to make us aware not to be complacent, not to somehow think, as they sometimes say, the Lord is in heaven, everything is fine with the world. And he says, no, 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 everything is not fine. There's a real problem here. One of the challenges, even in medical science, is the denial of the patient that there is something wrong with them. So even for a medicine to act, for a good diagnosis, the first thing is the acceptance that there is something wrong. When I accept that there is something wrong, it is easier for me then to find some solution to it. But if I remain in total denial and say, oh, it's all fine, then, then the solution becomes even more difficult. That's why even before we get knowledge, we must have knowledge of our ignorance. Because sometimes we may not know that we do not know. So first we must know that we do not know. Then we must know what is it that we do not know. And then we must know what we should know. So there is lots of things to know. Verse 142. Bhanu prabha sanjanita bhrapangtihi Bhanum tirodhaya vijram bhate yatha Atmo ditaham kritiratma tattvam Tatha tirodhaya vijram bhate svayam Just as the cluster of clouds produced by the sun's rays covers the sun and appears in the sky, so does the eye, sense, produced by the Atman, cover the Atman and appear by itself. So just as the clouds cover the sun, my ego covers the Atman. We have this I sense, I, I am someone, but this I is not the real me. This I is the cloud, and the real me is the sun, and the sun is covered by the cloud. Now, the sun is infinitely bigger than the cloud, and yet the cloud is able to, seemingly, able to hide the sun. In the same way, the Atman is infinite, the ego is tiny, but even then, just as the cloud covers the sun, the ego is able to cover 
the Atman, seemingly. 143. Kabalita dinanathe durdine sandra meghaihi vethayati hima janja vayu rugro yathaitan avirata tamasat manyavrute muda buddhim kshapayati bahu dukhai stivra vikshe pashaktihi. When the sun is completely covered by dense clouds on some terrible day, a fierce wind with freezing rain causes suffering. Well, we all know that when there are terrible winters here, we have experienced this. In the same way, when the Atman is covered by unceasing ignorance, the fierce projecting power afflicts the deluded person with profuse misery. Beautiful analogy here. 144. Etabhyam eva shaktibhyam bandhavpum sas samagataha yabhyam vimohito deham matva atmanam brahmayatyayam It is from these two powers, the power of concealing and the power of projecting, that a person's bondage has emerged deluded by which the person looks upon the body as I and wanders in the vicious circle of samsara. So we will stop here today. If you have any ideas, thoughts, questions, please feel free to ask. On Swamiji. Hmm. So, Swamiji, if God wants us to achieve enlightenment, why is it so hard? Mm. Thank you. It's a good question. First of all, we are making lots of assumptions in this question. First assumption is God wants us to be enlightened. Because if we assume that God wants us to be enlightened, it raises a whole host of questions. And that is, if God wants us to be enlightened, why did God make us ignorant in the first place? And so that's not probably a very helpful way to look at it. Or if you want to use the word God, then what this text says is God is within you. Your true nature is God. But your true nature is covered. And so if I feel an intense desire for enlightenment, then I can say that God is pushing me to seek enlightenment. But if I'm not worried about it, then that God who is dwelling in my heart is so much covered by this covering, concealing power of ignorance that God has not become awakened yet. And that, that's why there is a problem using the word God. Because when we use the word God, of course, the word God is used by many people and it rings different bells in different minds because everyone has their own idea of who God is and how God should be spoken about. And that's why you'll find the word God never gets used here uh, in that sense. What, it, what this text reflects on is what is the reality of my own existence and why I seem to be estranged from it now? Why am I alienated from my own true nature? And so making simply an assumption God wants us to be enlightened, then we need to ask like, which God are you referring to? That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. 
Good evening, Swamiji. If it is important for us to cultivate this longing for freedom, it seems that we would continue to be aware of all the ways that we're suffering and we're in bondage. And I'm struggling a little bit with how to th think about cultivating this and, and creating a sense of urgency around it while also thinking about this value of creating contentment. If we're trying to cultivate contentment and also trying to... Cultivate compassion. Uh, contentment. Contentment. Like yeah. thinking about okay. these um, yeah. qualities for the student how do we hold these two? Right. They seem um, yeah. op opposal, uh, oppositional. Yeah, very good, very good question. Because we are asked to have this, cultivate the quality of contentment. On the other side, we have to create discontent with our present state of existence and that we want to attain freedom. How can these two go together? And uh, answer to that is these two are already present in our heart now right now there are things in our life today we are contented about contented with and there are things in our life which we are not happy about what changes from one person to the other is what are the things i'm happy about what are the things i'm not happy about so when we speak about I wouldn't say atheist per se but for people who are religious who have interest in spiritual life but who but that interest is not that intense and so what happens in the case of many people and we might be able to think about people we know from our own circles, that many people are quite happy with doing a little bit of something spiritual. Say a little bit of prayer, a little bit of study, visiting a place of worship occasionally, and then they, they have satisfied that I'm a good person. I, I do the right things. So there is a sense of contentment about their religious life or their spiritual life. On the other hand, the same person will be extremely unhappy with the present government or maybe extremely unhappy with the state of the world. So there is tremendous discontent with things related to the world and happening around, but a relative amount of contentment with their own personal engagement in their spiritual and religious life. So we, we, we are already holding sometime these two things together. Now what the Upanishads and what these Vedanta texts want us to do is kind of completely flip it the opposite way. Can I be extremely not contented, extremely dissatisfied with my present state of bondage and while recognizing that things in the world are not perfect I can say okay that's fine I don't want to lose my sleep over these fluctuating states of this perishable world but I don't mind losing my sleep because I have not yet attained God I have not had a vision of God. I have not yet become enlightened. So we see in Ramakrishna's life, in the beginning, he was so restless for the vision of the Divine Mother. There's no, you don't see he's like, oh yeah, I'm doing worship here in the temple here. I'm quite happy and I get a lot of time to do puja. No, he, well, of course he was happy when he was doing it, but there was exceed we read in his book that as the evening would approach and as the sun is about to set, Sri Ramakrishna would roll on the ground in extreme pain and agony saying one more day has passed and yet 
I have not had the vision of the Divine Mother. I've not had a, I've not yet realized God. So there was this extreme discontent. But was he upset because his food wasn't cooked well? Or was the, it was too hot in the summer? Or there was a lot of dust outside? All of those things were there. It wasn't, wasn't as if the situation in Dakshineshwar temple where he lived, everything was like perfect. No, there was lots of horrible people who used to come there in that temple. Uh, but that didn't bother Ramakrishna as much as the sense that I have not yet had the vision of God. So in that way, it's possible to have both content and discontent at the same time, but directed towards different things in life. Is that okay? Samji, one question, for online question is, how does, how do tamas and rajas get the power to conceal and project the Atman? Who is projecting this powerful ignorance covering our real self? Good question. The ignorance has this power. These are inherent in ignorance itself. Um, who does it? I don't know. It's just there. What we can ask is, from where does ignorance come? And that question is a little tricky because the status of ignorance is inexpressible, is mysterious. The word that is used in Sanskrit is anirvachaniya. You cannot say anything about ignorance. You cannot say it is not there <clears throat> because we are all experiencing it. You cannot say it is there because if ignorance were real, it would never go away. It would never disappear, but it just vanishes. It's like the snake. What is the status of the snake that we see in place of a rope? You cannot say the snake is not there. Because if it were not there, how do I see it? You cannot say the snake is there. Because when I switch on the light, it's not there. So you cannot say it is there. You cannot say it is not there. You cannot say it is both there and not there. You cannot say it is not, not there and not not there. I mean, what they do is in this. Actually, this is exactly how it gets described in the books. that. You cannot say anything directly about it. And so they say it is mysterious. And therefore, in Vedanta texts, they have a different word to that. So there is a word real, which is sat. Unreal is asat. So they have introduced a third category called mithya. And mithya simply means it is real until you know it's unreal. And a snake is a little bit like that. As long as I see it, it appears very real. Then when I know, when I switch on the light, I say, oh, now it was unreal. A dream is like that. Real until we wake up and then it becomes unreal. This world is like that. Real until when I become enlightened, it becomes unreal. And so that is the status of ignorance. And this ignorance has these two powers. Now, because this ignorance itself is mysterious, the powers are also very mysterious. So that's essentially the idea. Yep. And another question is, what are we to make of Ramakrishna's referring to Maya as Mother Kali's world bewitching Maya. Is he, is he implying that there is some kind of divine intention to our ignorance? No, I don't think so. But I think sometimes what happens is the
the how best to express this the language that gets used in a in a devotional context the language that gets used in a in a yoga context and the language that gets used in 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 philosophical texts are very different for instance when we speak about is there any intention for god or mother kali for this ignorance to be there the problem with that philosophically is having an intention is a limitation we as 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 limited beings we have intentions we have this god as this one infinite one indivisible existence cannot have intention because intention implies a mind parts god then has parts and god will die and and so philosophically uh, speaking of god's intention doesn't make sense and yet in books they do sometimes speak about this is what god wants us to do this is what god intends and therefore then we have to say that well that's the kind of god that is well, let me put it this way this infinite reality of infinite divine reality when seen and imagined by someone in ignorance then that infinite reality appears like a very personal god so personal god is real but is a is the is the same impersonal infinite reality seen through a deluded eyes that's the best i can come up with right now <laughs> yes yes so you can you can bring the microphone a little in front so easier for you to move yeah okay um so my pranam swamiji yeah. so my question is um it's related a little bit to what rebecca was saying um where you know daily when you practice the spiritual learnings you see i mean for me personally anyway there are good days and there are really bad days mm-hmm. um so how do you how do you, so th- i can see getting lazy getting tam- all the tamasic properties getting kicking in really hard H- how do you how do you overcome that and how do you s- sustain uh continuity in intensity and in experience sure yeah that's that's something that's very necessary because spiritual life tends to have ups and downs there are these kind of a good times and then there is kind of a dry periods in the middle and that happens inevitably in everyone's life the question that we can have is how to minimize these lows and how to kind of have a more sustained practice and i think definitely what does help is recognizing the importance of the goal recognizing the importance of what we are trying to achieve you can see in some sense you can see about the way people are reacting to covid so when it began little more than 2 years ago when we knew very little about it and then when people saw that immediately after infection people are getting hospitalized people are dying in great numbers we realized how terrible it is and then everyone became extreme conscious they had this disinfectants and don't touch anywhere and be masked and stay social distancing and that remained for a while but a kind of an exhaustion sets in periodically and now after more than 2 years it's become even more and so there are now kind of feeling has come like 
I don't care whatever happens. Now, I'm not saying everyone does it, but there are a good number of people who have just kind of feel that either they don't care or somehow they have, based on some of the things that do appear in papers that, oh, now it's no longer as serious as it used to be, it's, and so on. But when we saw that it was serious, we took it very seriously. So similarly, in spiritual life, if whatever prayer meditation that I'm doing, and if the goal of the, all of that, as I see it, is God realization or becoming enlightened, how important is that goal to me? Just like this COVID thing, over time, does my intensity of wanting to reach that goal, does it also rise and ebb? There are times I might feel like, I must realize God, and there are some like, okay, that can wait, maybe, and so on. So one way to deal with that is to consciously keep up that, that, that lamp of wanting to be free, burning brightly. In fact, one of the Upanishads describes, gives the example as when an expecting mother who is expecting a baby once how careful a mother would be to to protect the growing baby in the womb because she's always careful that nothing should happen to affect the baby so similarly for a spiritual seeker once spiritual aspiration is like a baby in us and if i don't take care of that baby then accidents can occur and so we have to protect it and one way of doing that would be it's actually twofold way one is to see the positive side of it what will i gain by becoming enlightened why is it that it is a value to me why is it that i want it and the second thing would be what if i don't get it and that's why these verses that we saw today, this fierce wind with freezing rain causes suffering. We're kind of going up and down in this boundless ocean of samsara. This kind of a language and this kind of an imagery shows us if I don't attain that goal, I'm just once again lost in this infinite ocean. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we should be aware of the privilege that we have presently to have this time, a little time off from our daily activities to, to think about these things. There are many people who don't have that privilege. Those who have time may not have the opportunity. Those who have the opportunity may not have the time. And those who may have the opportunity and time, they may not have interest. So now, if we have interest in it, we have an opportunity, we have time. These three factors to come together, it may not happen always. If I die without attaining that goal, and if I'm bobbing up and in this infinite ocean of samsara, none of us has any control over where we would be reborn. And in that next birth, we may not have any of these privileges that we have now. We may not have any of the opportunities that we have now. And therefore, this has to be taken very, as, as a great uh, grace, act of grace from God, that we have this opportunity now to do so. So being aware of that, will make us use our time and energy in the best possible way. Yeah, sometimes if we just think about it, and that's why you remember the first few verses in this book, right in the beginning, it just says that getting a human birth and having all these opportunities, if I don't strive for enlightenment, 
that is the real suicide. Not simply taking off one's own body, because even if the body goes, another body will come. But having this opportunity to realize God and not making the best use of it, we have no idea how many billions and trillions more births we will have to take before perhaps this kind of a chance will come. So remembering this will also help in steadying our practice. Okay, so we will stop here today. And when we begin next week, we'll start with verse 145. Om Jananim Saradam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Muhur Muhur So we'll continue with the study next Wednesday. On Sunday for the satsang, our topic will be God laughs twice. And on Saturday we'll have meditation as usual. So let's conclude with the prayer now. May the Divine Being, who is the Father in Heaven of the Christians, Holy One of the Jewish Faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Auramasta of the Zoroastrians, the Great Spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength, freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace, and love. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto all.